next we move on to uh, Admiral Jayanta Pereira, a former uh, commander of the Sri Lankan Navy. And he will speak to us on maritime opportunities and challenges, Sagar, Sagarmala, and Sri Lanka. Thank you, Asok. Uh, give me a floor. Admiral Karambi Singh, uh, Chairman NF, and my friend, uh, Vice Admiral Belu Chohan, and Admiral Lamba, and Mrs. Chohan also here. I'm happy to see you after a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think my topic, I think so many people spoke, starting from finance minister, the minister, and my panelists also spoke the same. I think I'll have to say the same thing. But I'll try to cover and cover a little bit of uh, Sri Lankan situation. And also some question on the Hambantota also I'll try to answer. Ladies and gentlemen, Indian Ocean region has by far becoming the best example in shedding lights to, on the imports of regional connectivity in developing economics. The region holds a splendid strategic position, is emerging as a growth plural of, is being con considered one of the busiest east west uh, trade corridors in the world. Furthermore, Sagar and Sagarmala and seaport being triple S uh, initiative promulgated by India remains a promising strategy not only for regional nations, but also for both east west maritime proponents to work in unison and collaboratively by putting to practice common norms of development across the ocean. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean region continues to increase and region be begins to maneuver its way towards becoming a central maritime hub driving towards all global maritime initiative. Having in place secure modes of regional connectivity shall ensure that the region remains a zone of peace to all the member nations as well as others. Being an island nation, firstly as a SARC member state of having further assumed the chair of Iora in October 23, Sri Lanka believes that the Indian Ocean region will continue to harbor a gamut of opportunities further, empowering the region's sea lines of communication. Ladies and gentlemen, while preserving the organic unity and promoting cooperation amongst the Indian Ocean region member states should become a priority area for all regional endeavors. The region at large shall also hold the primary responsibility of ensuring that these waters remain both safe and secure for advancing economic partnership, both interregional and interregional. The concept of Sagara, therefore, introduced by the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi is a clear presentation of India's maritime strategy for advocating peace, stability, and prosperity across the Indian Ocean. The price of the blue economy approach of growth and development, the needs to move towards sustainable harnessing of ocean resources and the rise in demand for the use of offshore green energy have indeed made India's Sagar strategy a timely intervention. The aspect of security envisaged as being fundamental to Sagar vision not only advocates better connectivity for regional economic rejuvenation, but also reaffirm India's commitment towards safeguarding the region against traditional and untraditional threats. In order to become a substantial regional contributor of global economic growth and development, it is vital that regional waters remain free of non-traditional and traditional threats that may jeopardize regional maritime trade affairs, which particularly include the seamless movement of both goods and people. For such purpose, combating sea piracy, smuggling, maritime terrorism, illegal fishing, and trafficking of humans and narcotics shall be considered key transnational security challenges, which the Indian Ocean region is exposed to at large. On such grounds, enhancing and expanding the military and defense intelligence network to monitor the Indian Ocean security status is therefore mandatory. Ladies and gentlemen, the multilateral and bilateral naval exercises such as Milan, Srinex, Dosti, and Malaba carried out in the region and conducting of the rim of Pacific exercises, the successful implementation of maritime cooperative action strategy against piracy in the Gulf of Aden, the establishment of coastal radars network station in the islands of Maldives, Seychelles, and Mauritius and the setting up of the India's Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region, as well as India becoming founding member of the contact group on piracy have all been historic milestone of advancing Sagara strategy. 
coverage across the Indian Ocean in countering the non-traditional threats and associated risks. When unregulated uh, may also resolve the ecological issues, marine pollution, and diminishing fishing resources that can threaten the peaceful existence of coastal and marine ecosystem. Therefore, <coughs> curtailing these harmful effects by supporting practices such as Iora Blue Carbon Initiative remains primary responsibility of the Sagar strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, the neighborhood first policy which India is committed towards practicing has certainly served beneficial in mostly strengthening the regional security framework where assistance has been offered to many regional nations when, when encountered by a sudden crisis of natural calamities. Why will humanitarian assistance and disaster relief from integral part of Sagar outreach efforts? It has also become a clear-cut element of the evolving Indian Ocean security strategy. Moreover, India has been able to implement these practices meticulously as first responded to call assistance by existing relief support to countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. When the countries were worse affected by natural calamities and such as floods and cyclones and other disasters. Ladies and gentlemen, in developing sustainable regional maritime security architecture, in terms of those proposed by Sagra Vision, which promotes the use of corporate <coughs> action-based approaches for mitigating regional maritime challenges, not only India, but all regional nations will certainly have its share of responsibility to shoulder. Therefore, providing better connected opportunities for regional nations to grow and prosper a secure manner in essential India's Sagramala strategy, which yet again is viewed as a well-designed maritime framework. Strongly supporting port-led regional connectivity is an ideal initiative that has greatly helped regional nations in harnessing its coastal potential and full capacity of their seaports and natural harbors. Regional nations that have aligned their port-centered activities with Sagaramala mission are now sporadically working on port infrastructure development port-centered industrialization development of virtual platforms for accessing port functions and strengthening the role of Coast Guard agencies. India holding port as a forerunner of the Project Sagaramala is also rapidly investing the concept of port-led regional connectivity, the Kaladan trans uh, transport project in Myanmar, the trilateral highway between India, Myanmar, and Thailand, and Chaba port we discussed uh, project in Iran are several of the efforts administered and navigated by India in, the, in this direction. It is evident that such advancement taking place in the regional maritime domain will also act in favor of regional alliance with the free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific policy and India's act is policy. policy. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, at present, Chair of Iowa and the attaining the national target of becoming carbon neutral by 2050, the present work scope of Sri Lanka maritime sector has gained much prominence as an economic growth engine. The impact of both Sagar and Sagarmala initiative on the island nation have added much value for Sri Lanka to integrate its maritime policies and strategies with all regional movements in a positive and progressive manner. Great attention will be paid by the government towards rightly tapping the maritime sector potentials, not only for shipping purpose and support services, but also for reaping greater benefits from the riches of blue economy. Formulation of supply-driven maritime policy for natural, uh, national maritime and logistics sector, speedy development of port infrastructure, and encouraging investment in offshore energy, resources such as offshore hydrocarbon, Exploration, green hydro production, offshore wind farming, and solar energy production are several of the targets set forth by the present national development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, now in Sri Lanka, we have major three ports one Colombo, one Hambantota, and Trinkamali. There are two small ports that is in KKS and in Gaul. Now, the KK's port, Kankasanthuri, the north of Sri Lanka, it's not a commercial port, but 
it's a domestic, but recently we have started a ferry service between North and the Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry. The people actually, this is long overdue, after the uh, finish of a war in Sri Lanka, Northern Peninsula people requested to do, but now we have started. So the people, not only that, then we have uh, started the airlines also. So people have connectivity there. So I, at the moment, uh, they are enjoying the para diplomacy in Northern Peninsula, that is from North to South India. So they can carry items, they can bring items. We have a lot of, not no restrictions, but we always secure, check the security aspect as well. Then the Trincomalee, you know, is a very old harbor, a natural harbor. It's a very deep draft. During the war, it was useful as a headquarters of British. And it's uh, not much developed, but only a few industries are there. And the, we have a tank farm, 99 tank farm, that is already given to India on lease. And now government has uh, come uh, to agreement with the Indian government to develop Trincomalee as a commercial hub to cater for Eastern fleet or Eastern shipping in Sri Lanka and the India. Then we'll come to Hambantuta. Of course, Hambantuta, we, the question is why Hambantuta? Now, sir, you asked, now, uh, Hambantuta actually, you know, with, in Sri Lanka, we had a height of issue. Colombo Harbor is completely restricted, and LTT tried to destroy and completely collapse the harbor. They had tried many times, but successfully we had repulsed. But most of the shipping community, wide shipping, they were reluctant to come to Colombo. Reason, because then they have increased the high uh, premiums and insurances, and they were reluctant to come, and we had to send dummy pilots, we had to escort the ships. Then the government thought as to go as an alternative port, the Trincom little far, so we have a history, the old kings of Sri Lanka, they have built, uh, built ships, and they have sailed from there to Myanmar, taking elephants from Sri Lanka for business, and maybe to take Buddhism also to Myanmar, to, Columbus, to Sri Lanka. So that was the reason, then after that, during tsunami, that was a lagoon area where due to the tsunami, it was completely washed off, and it was open to uh, this, uh, the main sea. So then they have identified this is the best area to have alternative small one. Then, uh, as a, after finishing of the war, the government decided to go for a, uh, another alternative port. Then we asked for a loan. I don't know, it is I have not seen in writing, but they said initially they have offered to Indian government. But Indian government also at that time were a little reluctant, maybe due to the pressure of Tamil Nadu, maybe the elections and something. But then China jumped in, took the opportunity, and they have funded. So with that, so we have developed, I think initially it was a small harbor, but it was then the Ambantara airport also came, then the highway also came to connect the Colombo. Then after building completely building up, the government changed, Sri Lanka government changed. The next government, they were not happy because they had to pay a lot of loan, they repay. So what they did, they negotiated the Chinese government and sold the ent entire thing, not sold, given them on 99 lease. Then we, have, we got, I think, $1.2 billion. So that was used to repay the normal, whatever amount that we have taken. So still the, the country is paying that loan. The SLP is paying the loan. So that is the situation now, but now they are doing only rural operations, bulk cargo, and some fuel are coming, not much of operation. I think I, about a few days back, I checked uh, the normal movements of shipping is about 50 ships per month. So that is not enough, it is there. Then some ships came, about the doubt actually, it's not to Hambantota. One came to Colombo initially, first one came to Hambantota. You know, that's a big issue because, you know, naturally, as uh, you said, uh, if enemy at Himalaya, definitely enemies in Hambanto as well. So that doubt is there. And uh, we, our government is also very concerned about Recently, our president gave an interview to UN Nations, some reporters. They said, we are not aligned to anyone, but we do business, but we are not. But we are very concerned about national security of India, because you know, India's security is Sri Lanka's security. Your development is our security, so we will never be able to, we never, ever we will compromise national security of another country. We can't do, we are an unaligned country. So that is the situation. Then, after, then it came first time, there are a lot of issues came up. Then, government wanted to have a SOP, standard operating procedure, whenever Chinese ships come to Colombo, Hambantara Harbor. 
So what happened? The before it promulgates, the next ship also came. So that is the issue. Then anyway, it was delayed, but uh, it, it, we were compelled to accept that ship, but we monitored. I think we have kept your Indian High Commissioner also in Colombo informed. And the security and the complete control of the harbor is under government of Sri Lanka, not with anyone else. Now, I think a few days, few months back, I think in future, our naval head, southern naval headquarters will be shifted to Hambantara port, that is as a safety measure, that is also there from Goa. Then ladies and gentlemen, we'll come to the Colombo. Colombo port, we have three, one actually we have public-private partnership with uh, Chinese uh, company, and there's another one, and the other one is manned by the Colombo. And one West Terminal has given to Adani Group, they are developing the location actually, and recently, about one week back, uh, they got a loan from uh, United States National Corporation, 553 million to develop that. That means, so it will definitely it will speed up the uh, construction. I think it will be in operation by 2024. That is according to the plan. At the moment, we do 7.2 million TUs per annum. With that, it will increase. I think another four or more, more than 10, 15, 10 to 15, we can increase. So if you take that, and the Sri Lanka whole of India, it's about doing now 21 TUs at the moment. Now, we are both are in the strategically very important place in the Indian Ocean. Jabalali is doing 14 TUs per annum. Singapore is doing 37 per annum. So I think we'll have to, we can control east and west of Indian Ocean, especially in the connectivity, uh, without any issue. Then uh, our Minister of Shipping, few months back, I think about one back, visited to your maritime conference, I think you also have met him. He was very convinced about the speedy development of work, especially on the hydrogen, green hydrogen projects, because that one day we also have to go for that. And they came back, said that they were very convinced that we have to be in par with uh, India, Indian, otherwise, you know, we will lose the business in future. So we have alerted and we have, uh, I mean, warned our shipping sector to be alert and go with that. Uh, that is all about and about the shipping sector. Uh, my personal view, and not only me, in the entire uh, shipping world also, we have to go in par with, uh, not in par with, actually go with the India. Otherwise, we will not, because we can't live in isolation. We can't connect, get, get connected to the world without going India. The security aspect, I want to little go back. Now, uh, in 1964, our Prime Minister, first Prime Minister, woman prize of the world, Mrs. Bandar Nayaka, she proposed in NAM, Cairo, the Indian Ocean Peace Zone. And it was supported by Indian Prime Minister Jawal, then Jawal Nal Nehru. And this was ratified in 1971 as in UN resolution and established Indian Ocean Peace Zone. It's still there, but in these presentations, you know, so many people are roaming around in Indian Ocean. Chinese are coming, Americans are coming, European, and the France is also, the French Navy is also there. I think uh, this is timely, the Indian, even the uh, Australian uh, Deputy High Commissioner also mentioned, the Indian uh, leadership must take the control of Indian Ocean uh, for security aspect. And uh, I attended last Goa conclave, and your CNS remarks was very, very good. And he said, finally, that we have to collaboratively do the uh, security uh, in one ship with different crews in area. That is a good proposal. In fact, I told him. So they might, it must come from the top level to other countries, and our government also willing to share, our Navy is willing to share. So thank you. With that, I conclude my uh, presentation, sir. Now, uh, uh, what I see is, for this, we are all opportunities, no challenges. So we must harness the challenges, what the India is doing, because we can't live in isolation. We are also in the good strategic point. And uh, security-wise, we'll never compromise national security of India. It's, it's affecting to Sri Lanka. That is even not only me, even the any government, whatever comes, comes. And uh, we, we are a Buddhist country majority. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 80% of Sri Lankans are worship great Indian. That is Lord Buddha. With that, I think we can't go away from any place. So with that, thank you. And once again, I want to thank Maritime Foundation for very 
fruitful discussion, deliberation that we had. And not only that, and India always helped Sri Lanka and during the war, help, tsunami, first to come, and recently, uh, the economic, you know, in Sri Lanka and downturn, and you all have responded. Your High Commissioner told me in Colombo, uh, your bureaucracy is very powerful, but still, Prime Minister has given to remove all the red tapes and help Sri Lanka. That is why we are slowly getting into the uh, right track now with the, with the current system. With that, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll answer. Thank you.